worker in the HPFS program here at Penn State Shenango, and at her other job, she counsels women who are suffering from postpartum depression, and that's what she's going to talk to us about today. She's also a loving wife, mother of two children and one dog. <laughs> And she's one of my personal favorite human beings in the world. I am so pleased to introduce you to Kara Mild. Thank you, Chad. And thank you, Jack and Leon, for encouraging me to speak at this year's event. So uh, I have, as Jack said, I've worked here for the past seven years as an instructor. But I've also had this great privilege to work with women in treating them when they're at a time in their life suffering from postpartum depression. So I'm going to tell you about some symptoms, risk factors, postpartum psychosis, uh, and some things that I've learned in the seven years of doing the work that I've been doing, and more importantly, what I've learned from some of the women that have come to me for help. So first, uh, according to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or you may know it as NAMI, a really good source for information, uh, women are 70% 70, 70 more likely than men to experience depression. So just by our gender, we are more likely to suffer a depressive episode at some time in our lives. And approximately 15% of women experience significant depression following childbirth. Now, we're talking about stigma. And there can be incredible stigma related to postpartum depression. Because when you have a baby, most people are saying to you, this is the most wonderful time of your life. This is the most joyous time of your life. You must be so happy. And those words could be the farthest thing from what the woman is internally experiencing. She could be experiencing incredible sadness, not feel like herself at all, even maybe having strange uh, beliefs or uh, visions, and I'll talk about that. Um, and many suffer in silence. And that is the main message of standout stigma is that as long as I have air in my lungs, no one is going to suffer in silence. We're going to talk about this, we're going to be educated on it, and women do not have to suffer because there is incredible treatment. So first, what are some of the symptoms? Let me go to the symptoms first. Uh, some of the symptoms for postpartum depression they may not be what you think. We hear depression and we think sadness, but they may be feelings of anger, irritability, guilt. I'll talk about guilt because women, we're guilty about things we do, things we don't do, things we should have done. We were put a tremendous amount of guilt on ourselves, and especially at the time of uh, childbirth. Um, tr tr trouble concentrating, excuse me, Thoughts of hopelessness, and sometimes thoughts of harming the baby or yourself. So ultimately, that's what we want to prevent with treatment. We don't want to hear about tragedies in the news where women um, have drowned their babies or have committed suicide themselves. But these are tragic events that are preventable with treatment. And you may not know that there is not only postpartum depression, there is postpartum anxiety, postpartum obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, and postpartum psychosis. So if you're going to seek help for this disorder, you really do need to find a trained professional that knows um, how to, to treat this. Now, I have the great honor of working in an OBGYN's office. The wonderful thing about that is that we can get treatment, medication, and counseling within a week or less. Now, I, I know there's agencies in this community doing great work, but they're often really busy, and, and people are overworked. People could wait two weeks, a month, maybe more, 
for an initial intake. So that doesn't have to happen when we have a clinical social worker like myself right in there with the doctor and we can treat this uh, immediately because frankly it's not something that can wait to get help and stigma is one of the reasons that women wait to get help. So um, postpartum anxiety, some symptoms there, worry, fears, a lot of fears about the health and safety of the baby. Uh, some women may have panic attacks, shortness of breath, chest pain, they may wonder what's wrong with me, I've never felt this way before in my life, and they have, may have a feeling of that they're losing control. This is all related to postpartum anxiety. And we would treat that differently in some aspects than postpartum depression. Uh, postpartum obsessive compulsive disorder. This may include repetitive, upsetting, unwanted thoughts or mental images, and sometimes the need to go over and over things many times to reduce anxiety. Now, when I say unwanted images, um, they're, they're quite shocking, but I'm going to say them because if we don't verbalize things, we don't heal. So some women see, uh, literally see, for example, um, an image of a pitchfork being thrown into their baby. Um, they have images of their baby um, drowning or falling and cracking the baby's head open. They don't want to have these images and they wonder, what is wrong with me? Am I crazy? Well, they're not crazy, they're ill. And they are experiencing a postpartum uh, illness that is treatable. They're often afraid to talk about that because they're afraid that somebody is going to immediately assume it's postpartum psychosis, which by the way, postpartum psychosis occurs in about one, one the statistic is one to one and a half in every thousand births. Okay, so it's pretty low. So when someone's having the scary uh, visions with their baby, um, that's most likely postpartum OCD, not psychosis. Psychosis would be that there's a break in reality. It usually involves uh, delusions. Uh, typically they're centered around religion. God's telling me to drown my baby. They're hearing voices. So they're having the auditory visual hallucinations as part of that. So uh, those are just some of the symptoms. Uh, at the office where I work, I brought the assessment that I use, and you know, we ask women all the time, can you laugh and see the funny side of life? Often they can't. Um, do you blame yourself when things go wrong? Often they blame no one but themselves, and, and they feel like a failure, that I just can't do this motherhood thing, and even wonder, uh, will my child, will my baby ever love me? Um, they feel scared, panicky for no good reason, very overwhelmed. So they may also have be full of doubts, have mood swings, be overwhelmed, sleep deprived, because uh, in case you don't know, babies sleep a lot, but they keep us up a lot. <laughs> so women are often incredibly sleep deprived while they're trying to maybe you know make important decisions and just adjust to life because life as they knew it is no longer the same so some other symptoms i want to make sure that i don't miss any symptoms before i move on to risk factors okay so risk factors we need to know the risk factors because it helps if tremendously if we can tell a woman, you're, you're at risk for this, let's monitor you, uh, and that way, if needed, we can get you the medication and the counseling and the supports needed quicker. So here's some risk factors. Family history of depression, anxiety, or postpartum depression. Um, for myself, I certainly have a family history of mental illness, and I had postpartum with one of, one of my childbirths with the other one I did not 
That's very typical. So just because if, if you have one child and you don't have it, women think, oh, well, I'm in the clear. I'm not going to have to worry about that. And that's not true because every pregnancy is completely different for many reasons. Um, inadequate support in caring for the baby. Women need so much support, and that is absolutely a risk factor. Financial stress, marital stress, complications in pregnancy, birth, or breastfeeding. If women feel they can't breastfeed, that's another area where they can feel like a failure. I can't even feed my baby, and they feel awful about it. Um, mothers who've been through fertility treatments. This one is very important, and I had a patient that I'm working with really enlighten me on this topic, because can you even imagine trying so hard to get pregnant that you're going through fertility treatments, you're meeting with your doctor, you're doing everything right, and then you finally get this beautiful baby, and you feel like your world's turned upside down. You may feel like you can't even bond with that baby or even like that baby or like yourself and feel like a complete failure. Um, so women that go through fertility treatments, much more likely to have postpartum. It is a risk factor. Um, crying and sadness is uh, a symptom that you may see as well. But again, with risk factors, mothers whose infants are in the NICU or neonatal intensive care, women with a thyroid imbalance are more at risk. This is important because we talk a lot in healthcare about physically, how's the woman doing physically after the birth, but not necessarily mentally. So physically, it takes three months approximately for your hormones to stabilize and get back to their uh, pre-birth condition, we'll say. So we have three months where our endocr endocrine system is still trying to balance itself. And in that time, um, that time is very crucial. And if a mother during that time has their child's in the NICU, they have a thyroid imbalance as well, they can have other biological factors going on that put them more at risk for postpartum depression or anxiety disorders. Um, so those are just some risk factors and with the risk factors I want to stress that childbirth is a time I think women need as much support as ever before. And I can say I've worked with moms who have been in the military who have had high pressure careers and they feel that their lives are just turned upside down. They don't even know how to function anymore on a daily basis after the birth of a child. So that's how intense it can be for some people. Now of course it can also be a great experience for some people and some people do automatically bond with their child. But we can't assume that everybody does because that is, we know that that is not everybody's experience. So, uh, treatment consists of, and treatment works, you know, we say that, it's stamp out stigma, but it is so true, I've seen people be turned around time and time again through not only counseling with me, maybe counseling with somebody else, but medications as well. So typically with medications, we're giving SSRIs or antidepressants for uh, postpartum OCD or maybe giving some anxiety disorder medications. And typically treatment is about 12 weeks. It's intensive, it's every week. And we run into challenges with treatment though, because sometimes a woman has to choose between breastfeeding or her medications. And now there's another choice of, uh, um, you know, maybe I've been thinking, I want to breastfeed, I want to do this for my child, and then the time comes and maybe they're not able to do that because of needing to be on medications. That can cause a significant amount of conflict within the woman. And again, make her feel like this is just something else I've failed at. 
I can't do, I can't feed my child. So, what have I learned personally in the past seven years uh, working with women suffering from postpartum disorders? The number one thing that I have learned is that whatever psychological insecurities are pre-existing, so if a woman has low self-esteem, if they have a history of trauma, if uh, they had a history of eating disorders, body image, whatever it is, there's something about having a baby that brings up every issue you've ever had in your entire life and essentially smacks you in the face with it. And that doesn't feel very good. So and that's happening at the same time that biologically our hormones are not stabilized yet. Um, so what do we do about that when women feel um, like a failure because the process of parenting is not a one time, I'm gonna do this and get it right. And those of you that are parents, you know this, you have never failed more in your life than you have being a parent. I have, and anybody that's a parent has. You fail, you try something else. And if you don't like trial and error, you better get really used to it, being a parent, because it's a ton of trial and error. But initially, initially, during those that first few months that a, a woman is suffering, she needs a tremendous amount of support. And sometimes women will say to me, I don't know if my baby will ever love me. And what I say to that is, think about your own mother, okay? Because unless you had a ter horrendously abusive mother, uh, most of us, no matter what our mother's weaknesses are, we have such a love for our mother. And if you can think back to being a child, my goodness, your mother is everything to you. So, but in the moment when someone's experiencing a postpartum depression, they think, this child may never love me. Okay, a very distorted thought that needs, uh, that needs some treatment in the form of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is mostly what I do with these women in conjunction with medication. Uh, the second thing I've learned, women are pressure cookers. Um, we put enormous pressure on ourselves. I talk to women every day who have just had babies, and they say, I need to lose 55 pounds, like yesterday. Um, I'm not being the parent that I thought I would. And sometimes I feel like, but you've only been doing this for three days. <laughs> you know, let's give it a chance. But women put tremendous pressure on themselves to attend to everyone else's needs but their own. Um, and I have to say, women, stop comparing yourselves to other women. Okay? If you see someone at the grocery store and they look like they have it together, they probably just spent the last 15 minutes crying in their car. So we have to stop comparing. It's never a fair comparison, never, to compare what I know about my inner life to your outside shell that I see walking around Walmart. Don't put yourself through that and put that pressure on yourself. Also, the other thing I've learned is that sometimes bonding takes time. And sometimes due to an illness, bonding takes time. Here in the United States, we don't like anything to take time, right? We want to rush everything. Go to the drive through get your hamburger, go to the next thing, the next thing, hurry, hurry, hurry. Well, bonding is something that you can't rush. I remember when I had my first pregnancy and I knew I was going to be off work for 12 weeks. I remember saying to my mother, what am I going to do for 12 weeks? <laughs> like, I mean, how, how stupid, right? But I thought, this is great. Like, I'll get everything done that I haven't got done. I have 12 weeks. I had the baby, and 12 weeks is like a day. And 
I was absolutely not ready to go back and do anything after 12 weeks. But that's what we do here in the United States. In many other cultures, women take off six months to a year for a childbirth, which when we understand it, it makes a lot more sense. So bonding is something that we just can't rush. And it takes time to unfold, okay? So we need to give ourselves permission to have the time and space with our families to bond. And we need female role models in regards to parenting. Um, the Kardashians don't qualify, okay? So we, <laughs> and I say that jokingly, but you know, I don't watch them, but when I have, I thought, I just, I have to turn this off. It's gonna affect me negatively in some way. But I feel in our culture, we're really in a lack of female role models. So women experience, okay, I have a baby, now I don't even know what to do, okay? I have seven years of higher education under my belt, and I couldn't figure out how to take a newborn to Walmart. Could not go. So, you know, that makes you feel like, what is going, what is wrong with me? What is going on here? If we don't have mentors and mothers and aunts and cousins and families that support us and show us um, how, how to change labor, how to care for a baby, again, get ready for lots of trial and error. Um, the last thing I've learned is that because of my own mental health issues and experience with postpartum, um, it's been one of the joys of my life to help intervene with these beautiful mothers. Um, and most importantly, the next part is what a patient of mine recently, who's become uh, very special to me, uh, and shared some of her personal insights so I would like to share them with you now. Uh, number one, after having a baby, your normal coping skills are stripped away from you. So if you used to like to walk or run or exercise or just have 15 minutes to read on your own, you can't cope that way anymore. Maybe because you've had a C-section and physically you can't walk or run for a really long time now. Uh, or you certainly can't just leave your baby at home and go for a jog. And often partners or spouses are trying to do the best they can, but they're working and, and they're busy as well. This can cause a lot of problems because many of the women I talk to, they start to feel resentment mm -hmm. towards their partners. They feel like my world is turned upside down and his just keeps going on as normal as if nothing's happened. So again, this can cause marital stress. These are things that women need to talk about. They need to have new ways of coping or at least know that the way they um, have coped before can eventually come back. Stigma of asking for help. Women, we want to portray that we have this capable image at all times. So, we can ourselves feel like I can't say that I'm struggling at being a parent. We have to be honest with ourselves, and this is what my patient said to me. Until we're honest with ourselves and speak to people about it, how will people know we even need help? Well, they won't, and then likely you won't get the help. Um, certainly there's stigma with medication, and lastly, women are already incredibly busy before having a child. So many are managing careers, households, finances, and now they have to adapt to all new routines, a whole new way of living, and they need more support than ever before. So the main message of this is that if you experience a postpartum mood or anxiety disorder, you're not to blame, it's not your fault. It is a real medical condition that counseling and medication can treat. And also, uh, 
that nobody needs to fight alone in this. So the way I'm looking at stamp out stigma is we as professionals even have stigma. We have to get it out of our own minds and hearts first, then out of our homes, and then out of our communities and agencies. So that's what I want to challenge everybody to think about, is how you can uh, think of these disorders in a different way and start to get rid of that stigma. So if you are suffering, please reach out, get help. Oh, there's also a postpartum depression and anxiety hotline that is it's not a suicide line, it's a line where you can talk to professionals. It's kind of like what's called a warm line. I did put the paper on everybody's um, table, so that information is there. Um, so, once again, nobody fights alone. So now I would like to have uh, Tony Paglia come up. He's our campus counselor.